Today's show is brought to you by Amazon. If you want to shop at Amazon.com and support the podcast as well, please go to LookingBackPodcast.com, click the Amazon banner on the front page, and out of whatever you buy, a small percentage comes back to the show, and it's a great way to help us out. We're also brought to you by PayPal.com. If you want to donate to the podcast, either a one-time donation or a monthly donation, go to LookingBackPodcast.com, click the PayPal button, donate button on the bottom of the page, and that takes you to the PayPal page where you can donate however much you wish. It will be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. And with that, let's take a look back at part two of our series on, again, one of my favorite comedy groups of all time, Monty Python. Enjoy the show, and thanks for listening. And now for something completely different. <laughs> What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to part two of our series on Monty Python. The previous episode, if you haven't listened to, I do recommend you listen to that before you get into this one. We talked about the history of the group, how they met, what shows they were on before coming together as Monty Python. This episode, we're going to get into their movies that they released post Monty Python's Flying Circus. And we're going to kick things off with their very first one, 1971, called, as you heard at the um, intro, the little intro song thing for the show, um, you heard John Cleese singing out for something completely different. That was the name of this uh, sketch comedy film that was based off of the TV show. Um, it came out in 1971, and it was based off of sketches um, from the first two series, and that title was used as a catchphrase in the show. It was released in 1971, and it's about 90 minutes long, and it consists of sketches from the first two series. Uh, In the U.S., we call it seasons, but in Britain, they call them series. Um, The TV show. The sketches were remade on film without an audience and were intended for American audiences who had not yet seen the series. The announcer, John Cleese, appears between uh, some sketches to deliver the line and for something completely different. And in situations such as being roasted on a spit, lying on top of a desk in a small pink bikini, among other things as well. This was the Python's first feature film, and it was uh, their sketches were reshot on an extremely low budget, um, slightly edited for cinema release. Some famous sketches included are the Dead Parrot sketch, the Lumberjack song, Upper Class Twit of the Year, Hell's Grannies, and the very well-known Nudge Nudge sketch. It was financed by Playboy TV, uh, UK's executive Victor Lowndes, and it was intended as a way of breaking Monty Python into the U.S., and although it was ultimately unsuccessful, the film did good business in the U.K., and the group doesn't consider the film a success, but it enjoys a cult following today. It was the idea of Victor Lowndes who convinced the group that a feature film would be the uh, most ideal way to introduce them to the U.S. market and make them a lot of money, and he acted as an executive producer. Production didn't go entirely smoothly. Um, Lowndes tried to exert considerably more control over the group than they had been used to at the BBC. In particular, he objected so strongly to one character, Ken Shebby, that the sketch was removed, leaving both Terry Jones and Michael Palin to complain much later that the vast majority of the film was, quote, nothing more than jokes behind desks. Another argument with Lowndes occurred when Terry Gilliam designed the opening credits for the film, and he uh, presented the names of the Pythons in Blocks of Stone. Lowndes tried to insist that his name be displayed in a similar manner. So initially, Gilliam refused, but eventually he was forced to give in, and Gilliam then created a different style of credits for Pythons, so that in the final version of the film, Lowndes credit is the only one that appears in that way, in the blocks of stone. The budget of the film was considerably lower for the time, only 80,000 pounds. This is um, 
acknowledged self-reflexively, I might say, in the film's Killer Cars animation. The voiceover animation done by Eric Idle mentions, quote, a scene of such spectacular proportions that it could never be in your life be seen in a low-budget film like this. You'll notice my mouth isn't moving either, end quote. The film was both shot on location in England and inside an abandoned dairy rather than on a more costly soundstage. In fact, so low that some effects were performed in the TV series could not be repeated in the film. The origins of the phrase, and now for something completely different, is credited to Christopher Trace, who is the presenter of the telev uh, kids' television program, Blue Peter, who used it in all seriousness as a link between segments. Many of the early Pyth episodes of uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus featured a sensible-looking announcer played by John Cleese, who was dressed in a black suit and sitting behind a wooden desk, which in turn is in some ridiculous locations, such as behind the bars of a zoo cage, um, mid-air being held aloft by small attached propellers. The announcer would turn to the audience and say, And now for something completely different, launching the show's opening credits with the second series of the show. The phrase was also a transition within the show. Often it would be better added to better explain the transition. For instance, and now for something completely different, a man with a tape recorder up his nose. In later episodes, particularly in the third season, the credits launching was reduced to a split-second stock footage of an announcer saying, and now, in a similar fashion as was done with its predecessor, the it's man, which appears immediately after. Both were preceded by a naked organist, usually uh, Terry Jones. Some of the sketches that were in and now for something completely different, a lot of these, like I said, were in the TV show, but they were re-recorded with a very, very uh, low budget. The first one is How Not to Be Seen, and that was a government film which dis first displays the importance of not being seen and then devolves into various things being blown up, much to the amusement of the narrator, who is portrayed by John Cleese. Then you had the main title sequence, animated by Terry Gilliam. You had the man with tape recorder. Uh, immediately following the main title sequence, a screen appears announcing the end. An MC, who is Terry Jones, uh, steps on the stage, explains that the cinema overestimated the film length and announces an interval. In the meantime, two short films are shown, one star uh, starring a man with a tape recorder up his nose and another man with a tape recorder on his brother's nose with a brief stereo segment at the end of the second film. In a decided bit of irreverence, the tape recorder is playing La Marseille, the French national anthem. The next sketch is Dirty Hungarian Phrase Book. A Hungarian gentleman who is portrayed by John Cleese enters a tobacconist shop and reads from his phrase book the declaration, I will not buy this record, it is scratched, believing to be a request for cigarettes. Through some non uh, similar non sequiturs, he and the proprietor, played by Terry Jones, manage to arrange the purchase of a packet of cigarettes until the Hungarian's phrase book um, guided English devolves into sexual innuendos, such as, Do you want to come back to my place, bouncy bouncy? And the incident takes a dramatic turn as the tobacconist uses the phrase book to translate the cost into Hungarian. Six shillings, please. Um, which in Hungarian in that book is Yande Slava Grandwini Stravinka. And he's rewarded with a left hook. The Hungarian gentleman is swiftly arrested for assault but is released. And the author of the book, Michael Palin, is uh, arrested instead. The Hungarian phrase book had not yet been aired on the series as the film was made in the middle of the second season. Later on during the second season it aired in the spam episode. Then after that you had an animation called Hand Plants and Things which was an animation by Terry Gilliam depicting cut out hands and uh, plants and animals. Um, basically it was made to look like uh, trees that were literally hands. Um, the next animation was one called Barber Suicide. A barber put shaving cream all over his own head, and then he cuts it clean off. Then you had the sketch Marriage Guidance Counselor, who um, consisted of Arthur and Deirdre Putty, who was portrayed by Michael Palin and Carol Cleveland. They attend an appointment with Marriage Guidance Counselor, 
who is portrayed by Eric Idle, who ignores Arthur's rather tedious explanation of their situation. And he openly flirts with Deirdre, or Deirdre, eventually telling Arthur to leave the room so he could make love to the man's wife. Initially depressed by the turn of events, um, Mr. Pewdie is berated by a heavenly voice who tells Arthur to pull his finger out and thus bolsters his self-confidence, but his attempt to take command of the situation is uh, fails miserably. After that, you had the animation The Cannibal Baby, a man's pushing a carriage containing an unseen baby that eats several old women until an unintended victim is saved by an intervention of an irate viewer, actually the hand of animator Terry Gilliam, who reaches into the screen, turns the carriage around, and sets it to attack the owner instead. Um, the next sketch is Urban Renewal, which is the old lady saved in the previous sketch, is carted away by a truck and replaced by a statue of Michelangelo's David. You had another animation after that one called The Statue. An animated arm tries to remove the fig leaf, protecting the aforementioned statue's modesty. And after a brief struggle, he succeeds, revealing not the expected male genitalia, but the head of an old woman who demands smut like this not be shown on screen. After that, you had the sketch Nudge Nudge, and it has Eric Idle, Terry Jones, and Idle and Jones are in a bar. Idle asks another man, Terry Jones, about his wife, with a relentless stream of unsubtle sexual innuendos, and it turns out he simply wants to know, quote, what's it like? After that, one is one of my favorite sketches in the entire Monty Python ethos, Self-Defense Against Fresh Fruit. In a self-defense course, the teacher, portrayed by John Cleese, educates his students, which is Graham Chapman, Terry Jones, Michael Palin, and Eric Idle, how to defend themselves from an attacker armed with fresh fruit. The sketch starts off with the first of three on-screen appearances of Terry Gilliam, dressed as a nun, saying, Well, I think it's overrated, and his voice was dubbed by Connie Booth. The next sketch was Hell's Grannies. An uptight colonel, played by Graham Chapman, warns the film not to get silly again after the previous sketch, Self-Defense Against Fresh Fruit, and he orders the director to cut out uh, to cut to a new scene. So this begins a report about the disaffected urban behavior, which includes antisocial old ladies called the Hell's Grannies. You have men dressed as babies who seize random people off the street, known as the Baby Snatchers and vicious gangs of keep left signs, at which point the colonel stops the sketch for becoming too silly. After that one, you have camp square bashing. Um, an army platoon performs precision drilling in a highly effeminate manner, where the colonel again finds silly, and a bit suspect, I think, and he replaces it with a cartoon, that cartoon being called Rampage of the Cancerous Black Spot, and that animation depicts a prince getting a spot on his face, foolishly ignoring it and dying of cancer. And then the spot goes out to seek its fortune and gets married to another spot. After that one is the sketch expedition to Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, Arthur Wilson, who is portrayed by Eric Idle, goes to St. George Head, played by John Cleese, to join an expedition to Mount Kilimanjaro. But the interview rapidly descends into chaos due to Head's unusual case of double vision and another member of the expedition crash, uh, trashing the office. Um, the scene ends when Head is startled to see the next scene coming, as it presumably looks to him like a young woman with four breasts. That one, the next one, is girls in bikinis, and that is just simply sexy young women are seen posing in bikinis to the sound of lecherous male slavering, which ends abruptly when the camera pans to Cleves reclining on a desk in a pink bikini and a bow tie and saying the phrase, and now for something completely different. That one, something different, is a sketch called Would You Like to Come to My Place? A man, who is portrayed by Michael Palin, tells a police officer, John Cleese, of a theft, and after an awkward silence, decides to invite said policeman back to his place, presumably for sex, and after a moment, the policeman agrees and follows the man off. After that one is one called The Flasher, which is Terry Jones portraying a man in a grubby raincoat, appears to be flashing women on the street, he does a scene to the camera, revealing he is fully clothed, and hanging around his neck is a sign that just simply says, Boo. After that is an animation called American Defense. Um, American Defense, chrome toothpaste, and shrill petrol are advertised. 
The animated bit starts off with a rather attractive middle-aged secretary being consumed by hordes of yellow creatures, evidently made to resemble Chinese soldiers during the Cultural Revolution. After that is another animation called Conrad Poos and His Dancing Teeth. The 20th Century Frog and MGM spoofing logos introduce Conrad Poos and His Dancing Teeth, an animated photograph of Terry Gilliam set to the music of Josef Wagner's Under the Double Eagle. After that is a sketch called Musical Mice, with Terry, jo Terry Jones portraying a character Arthur Ewing has Musical Mice, uh, reputedly trained to speak at um, specific pitches. He announces that he'll play three blind mice, but he simply starts hitting them with mallets while humming the tune himself. His audience is enraged, and they chase him out of the studio. The next sketch is Sir Edward Ross, and the audience chases Ewing through a television studio, interrupting a talk show presented by Eric Idle, in which he's interviewing John Cleese, attempting to create a rapport, calls his subject Sir Edward Ross, portrayed by Graham Chapman, increasingly inappropriate nicknames such as Eddie, Eddie Baby, Pussycat, Angel Drawers, Frank, um, claiming President Nixon has a hedgehog, hedgehog named Frank. And when he finally starts using um, less questionable names for his quest and convinces him to discuss his latest film, he tells him, oh, shut up. The sketch after that one is the seduced milkman. Uh, Michael Palin pays him milkman, getting seduced at the door of a house by a lovely woman, uh, played by Carol Cleveland, follows her inside, only to get locked in a room with other milkmen, some of whom are very old. The next sketch is the funniest joke in the world, um, played by Michael Palin, and a man, a character named Ernest Scribbler, who is shown writing the previous sketch and discarding it and its sudden inspiration and writes a lethal joke. Anyone hearing it or reading it will literally die laughing. It's snapped by the British Army, who translates it into German, creating a devastating weapon that wins the Second World War. Gilliam plays one of the soldiers who shows the joke at long range to Terry Jones. Then you have three animations after that one, called The Old Woman Who Cannot Catch a Bus, uh, that's an animated man based on a portrait of Henry the Seventh of England, voiced by John Cleese, attempted to apologize for the poor taste of the previous sketch, but he's distracted by the animated uh, woman flashing their breasts at him and departs to chase after her. An old woman arrives on the scene, attempts to catch a bus, but it drives past. A second bus comes along, but it too drives past. And a third bus is flipped over when the woman trips it with her foot. Um... <laughs> This is ridiculous, but it's funny. The next animation is Killer Cars, and that's an overzealous attempt to curb overpopulation. Cars turn vicious, begin eating people. Eventually, a giant mutant cat is created to deal with the menace, and that plan works perfectly. The city is saved until the cat starts eating buildings. An anti-climactic, uh, cl um, cataclysmic battle against a giant mutant cat occurs off-screen, narrated by an old man, Eric Idle, who describes it as Quote, a scene of such spectacular proportions that it could never in your life be seen in a low-budget film like this. Which is a dig at the low budget of the film. The third animation is Dancing Venus. The mutant cat falls into a sausage grinder with a number of other animals. The resulting product, in quotes, leads into the hair of Botticelli's Venus, who stands on her shell, until an arm comes out of the water and twists her nipple like a radio knob. An upbeat music plays. She dances wildly until her exertions cause her shell to tip over, leading to, by way of Venus falling into a fish tank, the dead parrot sketch. Probably Monty Python's most famous sketch. Eric Pryline, played by John Cleese, attempts to get a refund for a dead parrot, but the shopkeeper, um, Michael Palin, refuses to acknowledge the parrot's passing on its... Um, passing on, and a twist ending that differs from the television show. The shopkeeper says, oh, I never wanted to be a lumber, I never wanted to be a, a, a pet shop owner. I wanted to be a lumberjack. And then it goes into the lumberjack song. Um, after that one is the uh, restaurant sketch, um, which is based off of the TV show as well. The employees of a restaurant, uh, Jones, Palin, Island, Cleese, react with ever-increasing melodrama to a dirty fork given to a dining couple, played by Cleveland and Chapman. That results in the horrible death of the head waiter, played by Idol, as well as a malicious attack by the chef, Cleese. And after a brief melee, a punchline is then shown, in which Chapman turns to the camera and says, Lucky I didn't tell them about the dirty knife. 
And after that, there's an animation, which is a picture of Rodin's The Kiss, with several small holes in the woman's leg. The woman straightens her leg out, and the man plays her like an ocarina. After that one is the animation, How to Build Certain Interesting Things. Garbage is dropped on a stage and banged repeatedly with the hammer, and it takes on the shape of a wheeled arm holding a gun, which rolls into the next scene, The Bank Robber. A bank robber, uh, John Cleese, mistakes a lingerie shop for a bank and attempts to rob it. After the owner, played by Eric Idle, stymies his hopes of stealing large quantities of money, the robber is somewhat put out by his error and makes do with a pair of underwear. After that one is people falling out of high buildings, which uh, is an office worker, played by Eric Idle, sees um, people falling past his window, but his co-worker John Cleese is uninterested until they realize there's a board meeting occurring upstairs and wager whether Parkinson will be next. A man played by Chapman then writes a letter of complaint, but just as he writes, uh, quote, I have worked in tall buildings all my life and never once an unknown force propels him screaming out of the tall building. After that one is an animation called The Bug, a bug with human-like features goes to sleep and wakes up as an effeminate male butterfly. And then after that is the animation of three people. Uh, three people singing in snow. Uh, they sing the title of the next sketch, which is Vocational Guidance Counselor. Um, Herbert Anchovy, played by Michael Palin, no, one, no longer wants to be a, uh, a chartered accountant, and he always dreams of being a lion tamer. And the counselor, played by John Cleese, suggests that Anchovy should instead work his way up to lion taming via banking, an idea which Herbert initially rejects until he's informed that the animal he thinks is a lion is in fact an anteater, and that mere stock footage of a lion scares the life out of him. He desperately cries out he just wants to see his name in lights, and his wish is granted by a magical fairy, played by Eric Idle in drag with the mustache. After that one is a sketch called Blackmail. Um... Herbert's initially mystified by his sudden role of hosting the television show Blackmail, but he gets into the idea very quickly, performing his new somewhat questionable duty with enthusiasm and panache. The next one is called The Battle of Pearl Harbor, and the silly-hating colonel appears again, introduces a group of women who is uh, the pythons in drag, led by Eric Idle portraying a character named Rita Fairbanks, who reenact the attack on Pearl Harbor but they just beat each other with handbags while rolling around in mud. After that one is the romantic interlude. A man, Terry Jones, and his girlfriend, Carol Cleveland, begin making love. Several suggestive images are shown, such as an industrial chimney collapse shown in reverse, a train entering a tunnel, torpedo being fired, etc. But the images are, only shown, are actually only films played by the man on a projector propped on the bed. The woman asks whether or not he's actually going to do something or just show films all night, in which the man says, just one more idea, and that proceeds to show the next and final sketch, that final sketch being upper-class twit of the year. Five mentally deficient members of the landed gentry go through a challenging obstacle course with such events as walking along a straight line, jumping over a wall made of two rows of matchboxes, and slamming a car door loudly. The winner will be the first competitor to shoot himself in the head, and in, one, in the process, one twit is so inept that while attempting to back up a car, he somehow manages to run himself over. And then after that, finally, is the animation, the end titles, rendered in the typical absurd style of Terry Gilliam. The film didn't offer anything extra for British fans except the opportunity to see the sketches in color at a time when many viewers still had black and white TVs. And indeed, many were disappointed that the film seemed to belie its title. Despite this, the film proved sufficiently popular to make a profit on domestic office takings alone. Reviews for American audiences were mixed, particip um, principally because Amer uh, British humor was unfamiliar to American viewers at that time, but it was mostly positive. And when it was released in August of 1972, the film had little success at the box office and didn't do well until late 1974, which was around the time that PBS started showing the original television episodes. And it currently has a rating of 90% on 
Rotten Tomatoes. That is the first film that Monty Python did. And the next one, you're going to love that one. On the next episode, we'll talk about one of my personal favorites of theirs, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So stay tuned for that episode. And again, I want to thank you so much for listening. And as always, take care of yourself and each other. See you guys next time.